Tonight is the launch of a new partnership with an old friend of mine, James Whitno Delano, who is the curator and founder of the Everyday Climate Change Instagram feed, which we think is a really exciting way to explore the world of climate change, how it's impacting us in so many ways, the ways that it affects our water, affects our human rights, affects our migration, affects, as somebody was mentioning today, our cultural heritage, and, and pretty much anything else you can think about. So we invited James to do a special selection from the feed by a number of different photographers, and you can see those on the wall and on the video up front. And for the next two months, we'll be focusing on programming around those issues. And just to bring it home, we're going to do a couple of things. One is that we've launched today the Body of Water Instagram campaign. <laughs> Looking at Sarah over there who's helping us put it together. Um, we are inviting you not just to post images, hashtag everyday climate change, which is part of the feed, but also Water Chicago. And over the next two months, we're inviting the general public, students, all kinds of people to post Water Chicago images, images that you feel show your community what fresh water, what water resources mean to you. And at the closing of this exhibition on January 30th, we'll have another reception. We'll show all the work that's been taken. Uh, James will pick one or maybe more images to go in the international feed, 50,000 followers. Um, and it'll really give us a chance to show policymakers and, and the rest of our, our community that Chicagoans want to start the next year focused on water and resources, and that that matters to us. January's a good month to do that because around here, pretty much people just talk about the weather in January. So we thought, why buck the trend? Let's just go for it. So that's a little piece of paper. We'll have some more of those up front, up front and you'll be hearing about us on that. Um, the other thing that we're doing right now is we have our holiday pop-up bookstore, and we do offer free programming all year long. But if you do some Christmas shopping with us, some holiday shopping with us, some Annika shopping with us, it helps support these programs and keeps them free. So we'll be here today and also on Saturday. And then lastly, before we start, please do make sure to take one of these free programs home. This shows you the rest of the exhibitions through the year. There are always panels and talks and discussions. They're all free and we'd love to have you. So I'm going to turn this over to James. He's going to take us through five or six minutes of really in-depth exploration that he's done around the world. And then Dr. Peterson is going to talk with our panelists for about a half an hour about um, climate change and water and policy. We're really excited to have them, and we hope we'll have questions from you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you, so uh, I, my name is James Little Delano. Uh, as Leslie mentioned, uh, I'm a photographer, American photographer based in Japan for 22 years. And before we go any further, I just want to thank everyone at Artworks Projects. They've kind of treated me like a king. Leslie and I have uh, collaborated over the years and done some great things together. So it is, it's a wonderful relationship. Um, so talking about everyday climate change, um, over the course of 20 years, I've been documenting China and its rise, uh, China 20 years ago, kind of looked like Chicago in 1925. The, 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 but there have been costs to this, uh, this rapid rise, and I've been documenting them. And also a lot of uh, documenting the industrial scale land conversion in Southeast Asia, often for uh, oil palm, palm oil. And these are the, the impetus uh, for everyday climate change. And, just to finish up on everyday climate change, it's, it's uh, photographers from six continents documenting climate change in seven continents. And it was, it was very important to me when I reached out to my friends and friends of friends who are photographers that it not be an industrialized, people from the industrialized world in the north, say, looking and judging the south. We have people from, uh, from all over the world documenting climate change in their backyard. They may not be indigenous or native to that place, but they're at least still living there, as I do in Japan. Japan is, 
has been very good to me, and, and it, it's, as uh, I mentioned, it's, it's just a stone throw from, from China. Uh, what I want to do is I want to show you images from, mostly from Asia, and these are the kinds of things that got me thinking about uh, the climate change feed and our human hand in, in changing the environment. <clears throat> um, and also these will have a little bit to do with water. So this image here is, is uh, from Malaysia. It's in uh, Taman Nagara National Park. It's a 110 million year old rainforest. And uh, you know, as we all know, it's uh, the lungs of the planet, a major carbon sink, um, holds water. And the, the sad truth is that this is kind of the aberration now, the natural forest. This is a national park. In t all around this uh, national park, Taman Nagara has been converted to oil palm, almost all of it. And what it happens is you get from the most diverse ecosystem in the planet to something more like this. And this is, oh, less than a generation ago. This is in Sarawak, this is on the island of Borneo, still in Malaysia. Similar situation. This um, 20 years ago was a degraded forest. Loggers will go through two, two or three times. And finally, to create an oil palm plantation, they'll clear cut, terrace it as you can see, and plant oil palm. Um, essentially an arboreal cornfield. If you're in the forest, it's, it's warm. I mean, it's, it's about 85 degrees, but it's about 110 outside. The, the, the difference in temperature is immediately apparent locally. Also something I think this big impression on me was that this is, you know, obviously habitat for, uh, for wildlife, but also this is where the Iban lived. So this previous image here, this is the homeland of the Batek Negritos, and the Malaysian government doesn't want them to enter that forest and live as they had lived for at least 20,000 years, the original people of the area, perhaps more like 50,000 years. So this is Batek land, and this is Iban land. And that's something that gets lost. The indigenous people who lived here, they don't have land titles because they didn't need it. They didn't have a concept of land title. And first, uh, you know, the British kind of left the forest alone. A lot of this is post-colonial, post frank, frankly. And the government takes advantage of the fact that they have no land title. So the land is taken away from them. Um, <clears throat> so this is Malaysia, Southeast Asia dealing with water. This is actually a recent photo. I was flying in China. This is the Inner Mongolia. Half of Mongolia is a province in China. And this is the Tengger Gobi Desert. Uh, I flew over this ooh, uh, in the right around 2000 and looked down on the desert, not from California. And usually when you see a lake, a dried lake, you'll see a big uh, white patch because it's a saline lake. I was looking down on this, this region, and the sand dunes were like the waves of an ocean, and in between was green. And really intrigued me. How could this possibly be? I thought they must be salt water. But this, these are freshwater lakes from artesian wells, and they're drying up. This is the Alashan banner for the, the, the uh, Inner Mongols. And there used to be 800 lakes. Now it's down to 200, and they're evaporating because there's a mountain range nearby where they cut the trees, they overgrazed the, the, the land during the Great Leap Forward in the 1950s and took away the water source for these lakes. And this lake actually still exists to, to about here, but it should amount to here. This is all dried up. Eventually this will dry up. And there are, uh, there's an aquifer down below, and they're tapping into that, kind of like we do with the Ogallala aquifer in the Midwest. It's finite, it's fossil water, it will not be replenished. So the government right now, the Chinese government, is very quietly relocating Mongol settlements, which would be over in this area here. They're also doing it to the Tibetans up in Qinghai. So this assault on land rights is uh, going on, but people aren't talking about it very much anymore. The Chinese are getting a pass on this. So I went there back in, in May to talk about this. This is a quite close by, and it shows you how the, the, the desert is advancing. This is actually a relocation village from the 1970s. He's Mon ethnic Mongol. Uh, <clears throat> they were moved here. This settlement is sustained by wells. 
If there were no wells, there would be no people living here because it's completely dried out. It was a grassland, and now it's it's kind of a almost it's a semi desert, but it would it would never support, uh, support livestock. This is one of the solutions, uh, the, the gr Green Wall of China. And as long as there are sprinklers, it's, it, it is working. As long as you have water from the Yellow River, but the Re Yellow River is not a very big river. It's probably comparable to the Colorado River with a whole lot more people depending on it. Um, I don't have a photo here, but it's kind of interesting. I believe the Japanese actually introduced this, to, was to use grass to create a matting, a, a matrix of, of grass, of a straw, <coughs> to imitate the grass that used to sit on top of the sand. And that's actually working. But these forests, if you take away the water source, the sand will simply come back. But it is a huge problem for China. This is a uh, Ningxia uh, Inner Mongolia border, still the Gobi Desert. And likewise, this, is, this should be water going through these irrigation ditches um, and it's sand. So it's a huge problem not going away. So water is a huge problem for the, for the Chinese, huge challenge. This is South America. Um, this is in Ecuador. Cotopaxi actually erupted this year. Um, this is at about uh, 5,000 meters, 17,000 feet, and that's where you meet the glaciers. But these uh, I consider them miracles. I mean, the fact you have glaciers on the equator, they're volcanoes. This one's about, I think, 23,000 feet high-ish or so. They've lost 40% of their ice cover in the last 30, 40 years, and, and counting. So this is part of the source of the Amazon River. So this is a huge change. Um, and again, these are the, you know, the, the mothers of great rivers. So we're having this problem in the Andes, uh, of course in Tibet, where th these high altitude places, the temperature is actually rising more quickly than it is in temperate areas. And part of the, the challenge, and we were talking about this today, is uh, for me is, is to uh, talk about climate change in a temperate region because in a place like Chicago, I live in Japan, it's, it's much less apparent. Uh, because we, as the as the ecosystem changes, we're not a, we're not on the edge of habitation. So you know the, the, the plants will change. Farmers are going to have to adjust. Or the rain levels are going to change. But it's going to be much more gentle. The, the the consequences are than for people on the mountains uh, of uh, the Andes or in, uh, on the edge of a desert where it's far more acute. Change is uh, you know for example in Japan. Uh, we have strains of rice that it's so hot in the summer now, the actual kernels are starting to shatter in August. So they're gonna to have to change the grains, but pe these are specialities of regions and it will cause you know, relatively minor impact. But if you go to some place like this, people are losing their li livelihoods outright. This, Leslie and I worked on this one, actually. This is the Dominican Republic, and this is kind of looking at a photograph taken for one purpose, but it also reflects climate change. And he is a Haitian, he can be considered a climate change migrant. So this is taken in the Dominican Republic. He is making very little money, working as a undocumented worker, essentially very few human rights, because over in Haiti, of course, deforestation has led to the complete collapse of a lot of ecosystems. Very little work there. So this is a direct effect. He's had to leave his country because of the ecological damage and climate change due to human activity, the cut, cutting down of the forest. This is California. So you've got the, th what, you know, the worst drought in a thousand years. You've got expanding suburbs and more fires, wildfires, and than I can ever remember in my lifetime. Um, if you get up, and this is San Diego. This is a <clears throat> inland side of San Diego. Actually, my cousin's house had uh, the, the flames, they say, as they said, licked the, the side of their wall. The, they were lucky the firemen drew the line at their house. But these fires are coming uh, almost every five years now. Uh, if you drive through the Sierra Nevada, you can hardly go through the mountains, Yosemite National Park, for example, without pass, passing through 
wildflowers because it's been so dry. These are the Batek. So that first image you saw was right on the uh, edge of their territory. It used to be in the core. We're going in fishing. Um, I'll point out again what a fascinating people they are because this is Asia, this is not Africa. They were part of the first migration of humans out of Africa from Africa to an African-like climate. And those of us who are European, East Asian, Native American, our ancestors took a different route through Central Asia. Our bodies adapted and changed for climate. Theirs never had to. But the beauty of it is anyone who is, is European, East Asian, Native American uh, is more African than they are. And I love this because it shows that appearance means nothing. They look like they stepped out of Africa yesterday. Wonderful people, not very short in stature. Um, this forest is being prepared for uh, logging, and uh, now it, those trees no longer exist. It's oil palm. And uh, so, um, where was I going? Last point. Um, oh, good. climate change and land conversion, there are less than a thousand of them left. And there's another blend, uh, band of, of uh, Negritos called the Bo in 2010. The last living survivor of the Bo language died, taking their culture, their langu language with them, with her. And the Batek, there is precedent for this. I worry that they may, in a generation or two, not exist as people anymore. And think about what they can teach us about ourselves. So th this is where the passion for climate change comes in my own life. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Leslie, but this is this is where I'm coming from. And I, I, I see it as gathering phys uh, visual evidence and sharing it with uh, people, as many people are willing to, to watch as possible. So thank you very much, and, and uh, we'll shift gears then. My name is Chris Peterson. I'm the Academic Program Director at the uh, Institute of Environmental Sustainability at Loyola. Uh, we've been doing all kinds of really cool stuff uh, on uh, environmental sustainability. And in fact, this is just a quick plug, but keep your eye out in uh, next March for our third annual climate change conference. Uh, we're going to be having uh, Amy Klein, uh, the author of This Changes Everything, as our keynote speaker. So it should be, uh, should be really good. Uh, well, tonight uh, we've got three uh, panelists. We're going to be discussing uh, uh, climate change and water issues. Um, I want to start with um, uh, Jeff Walk, uh, who is with the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Director of Science um, in the Illinois chapter. Uh, here is PhD from uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Sorry. Urbana. 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 Oh, sorry. Urbana-Champaign. So his interests include avian uh, biology, conservation and agricultural uh, systems, and grassland ecology. Um, he has completed uh, climate change vulnerability assessments along with his team, and um, assessments of nearly 600 wildlife species. Uh, he serves on the Illinois Endangered Species Protection Board, the Illinois Audubon Society, and um, a board of directors, and was uh, president of the Wildlife Society uh, um, Illinois chapter. And um, Jeff, I'd like you uh, to, if you can, um, just kind of give us an overview of kind of how climate change works, uh, kind of in terms that um, the non-expert can kind of uh, follow, um, and it's uh, how it impacts uh, the access to water globally. All right. Um, sure. Well, in, in short, I mean, it's really talking about the an amplification of the greenhouse effect. So our atmosphere is very useful in that it, it sort of is a blanket for the planet. It keeps us from getting too cold at night and too hot during the day. Um, but there are a number of gases in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases that everybody's heard about, that through the activities of people have been increasing in concentrations tremendously, especially carbon dioxide, but also methane and nitrous oxide. And by amplifying this greenhouse effect, trapping heat within the atmosphere, we're seeing the planet warming up. And, and I'm, I'm glad to see uh, the images that James collected because this is not something that's going to happen, it's something that is happening. Uh, it's very well documented how concentrations of those, those chemicals in the atmosphere have been increasing over time, how the temperature of the Earth has been going up, and we're starting to see manifestations of how that's playing out. Um, obviously with hotter 
a hotter planet, we're seeing a melting of ice on ice sheets in Greenland and in Antarctica, resulting in sea level rise. We're seeing uh, melting of glaciers in alpine areas, uh, the Tibetan Plateau, the Sierra Nevadas in the western North America. That, and, and so we're seeing this water, uh, the melting of these, of these ice stores that a lot of people depend on for drinking water. It's also resulting in the sea level rise, which is putting people in vulnerable coastal areas at particular risk. And then with more heat trapped in the atmosphere, that warmer air can hold more water. And so we have more energetic storms that are occurring, resulting in these more extreme weather events. So we think about things that have been in the news like Superstorm Sandy. Uh, here in the Midwest, we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of high frequency precipitation events, the number of times where we get two, three, four inches of rain in a single event. Those are happening with strikingly greater frequency than they were just 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, so we're starting to see that, and that results in tr uh, a tremendous increase in flood frequency in many places around the world. Uh, and by office in Peoria downstate, right on the Illinois River, it used to flood two or three times a, uh, a year, or two, excuse me, two or three times, or two, uh, once out of every two or three years, and up through the 1990s. Now we're seeing that it floods two or three times every year. We're seeing an exponential increase in flood frequency. Right now we're experiencing the first December flood ever on the Illinois River. So this is manifesting itself in a number of ways uh, that are impacting water. Uh, but in other places, even though we're here in the Midwest, we have the, 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 the enviable position of having too much water, but in some cases far too much water. In other places, like in California, it's being manifested in drought. So we're seeing this incredible unevenness of water distribution, and it's particularly affecting people living in the most vulnerable places, as James illustrated. Uh, we're going to move to um, uh, Dr. John Murphy. Uh, central to his work uh, is understanding how multiple institutions interact with managing water, and whether these interactions uh, lead to positive or negative results. What I'd like to discuss a little bit about how your modeling uh, at Argonne uh, shows how humans and nature are kind of interacting and what that means um, to kind of the rates of climate change that we're experiencing. So I do computational social science. So I'm a simulation modeler, but um, sort of atypically I'm trained in social sciences. And so I model how people interact. Um, and I don't usually try to um, say, you know, if you put people in this situation, this is the way they're going to act. Instead, what I'll do is I'll say, you know, there are institutions that are set up that have particular domains that they're responsible for, and they have a particular interest that they're going to pursue, and they have to work with this institution that has a different interest, and how are those two things going to play out? Um, so, with respect to, you know, the general topic of how adaptation to ch climate change is going to happen, um, the answer is that because there's such a wide variability in what climate change is doing, it's going to happen in lots of different ways in lots of different places. Um, one of the, the, the projects that I'm working on right now looks at uh, a place that is not as fortunate as Chicago. It looks, it looks at uh, the, the U.S. Southwest. Um, and we initially started looking at uh, Phoenix and Tucson, Arizona. Um, and our, our initial interest was how do people perceive water resources? And we thought, you know, maybe people are unaware of how scarce a water resource is, and that's why they're, you know, they continue to water their lawns, and they waste all this water, and why do we have those cities in the desert anyway? Um, and it turns out that we sort of picked poorly for that. Um, the, uh, the reality is that we've done a pretty good job, or they've done a pretty good job, in Arizona of securing a water supply. There's this giant canal that pumps water up out of the Colorado River and takes it across the desert. And Arizona has a reasonable amount of water so that the law in Arizona now says you can't build a house in Phoenix until you've got a guaranteed water supply for the next 100 years. Um, now, of course, no one really knows for 100 years, but on paper, at any rate, at any rate it plays out. Um, but that's just a, a symptom of what's really going on, which is that the physical infrastructure is fine. The social infrastructure has allowed Arizona to construct a legal arrangement where they have the rights to the water. Meanwhile, next door, California has not done as good a job. So they're now facing all of these shortages, and it's largely a question of how these different institutions have played out. It turns out that people in Arizona are very aware of you know, how much water there is, and they're cutting back on their usage to the point where some of the water managers are actually 
um, backing off on the conservation message a little bit because frankly they need the sewer system to run. And if you don't have enough water going through the sewers, then it can cause other kinds of problems. Um, but sort of at a, at a larger, at a larger um, of way that we're looking at it, um, this question of, of how is the adaptation going to take place is going to always have to be um, uh, affected from a large collection of levels. So we have to look at the federal laws that are running the water system in the Colorado River, the state laws that are guiding it across to Phoenix and Tucson, down to the community level, down to the household level, and it's all of those things. And that's the same thing that is going to play out in all of these areas. The transition from, from forest to date palm is an aspect of the international economy. It's because that palm oil is so wonderful in Oreo cookies and things. Um, and it's going to play out differently in all these different areas. But you can't sort of get a grip, get a grip on it without uh, a, a very holistic, very system-oriented view of how the whole thing is, is playing out. We've got a, a couple of questions. Um, how does one kind of calculate the guarantee water availability for 100 years in a, in an arid region like the Phoenix area? Um, you would show that you have legal rights to sources that are, even in extreme cases, assured for, for that period. So um, the Colorado River is not going to go completely dry. Um, it may be very much reduced. And there's a sort of complicated system of priorities. So water that may be being used now is a low priority. And when the water gets short, that water is going to be taken away before the high priority water gets taken away. So Arizona, for example, a lot of the lettuce that you get comes from California. But a, a good chunk will come from Arizona because they have all these lettuce fields. And they're growing lettuce from this Colorado River water. They totally know that that is the first thing that gets cut. It's an intentional buffer. When the, there's like 400,000 acre feet that's guaranteed to agriculture, when the Colorado River allocation begins to get reduced, that will go away, but the municipal holdings will be fine. Another thing that Arizona is doing is taking water from the Colorado and recharging their aquifers by basically dumping it back into the ground. So they're filling up their own aquifers as a storage unit. Um, there's, a, there's a bizarre story that has to do with that's perfectly okay, but keeping water in Lake Mead, totally a no-no. You can't do that. You can truck it all the way across the desert and put it into the ground, and that's fine. But you can't leave it in a reservoir because that's not using it. Um, so they can now store water in the aquifers. There's also the Salt River. And you can sort of put together a case that says these sources, even in the worst case scenarios, are fine to cover the municipal needs for the foreseeable future, which they've defined as 100 years. Whether that is actually true, whether Phoenix in, in 2115 is going to be as, as cheerful on this topic, no one really knows. But at least on paper, they can sort of make it work out. Yeah, I've got one other uh, kind of dovetail on that. I mean, the Central Arizona project that has, that is an open system, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. How much water is actually lost to evaporation? Uh, if I recall, it's like 4%. Um, you know, it, it takes. It takes a few days to move the water the 200 and some miles across, and they've, they've factored in the losses. And it's, it's, um, if I, it's either 4% or 11%, but I think it's only 4%. It's, it's not as horrible as it might be. And they, they did studies to see whether it would be cost effective to cover the canal. Um, and that would, you know, 200 miles through the desert would have cost you know, a few billion dollars. So they're willing to let it go. Are you familiar with Fountain Hills? Uh, I've never been there, but I know yes. sort of where it is. I, I grew up in, in the Scottsdale area, and um, back in 1972 or something, somebody decided that they wanted to build a community in the desert that had the highest fountain in the world. Uh, and it runs 12 hours a day from uh, 9 in the morning to 9 at night. Uh, and the evaporation issues there I'm always kind of curious about. Yeah. We'll talk about the public actually being aware of these issues, that's one of the things that I just found kind of amusing in a twisted sort of way. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. Um, our next uh, participant is Michelle Carr. Uh, Michelle is the Illinois State Director of the Nature Conservancy uh, in Illinois. Michelle is leading efforts to advance freshwater, grassland, and urban conservation uh, initiatives, and is working closely with conservation staff and partners to build an urban conservation strategy in the city of Chicago. Um, Michelle is going to be uh, discussing 
kind of where we stand on, on policy and the impacts of uh, rates of climate change and what citizens can do to prevent uh, further problems and roll back some of the damage already done. Uh, but before that, you'd like to say a few things about um, the Nature Conservancy. Hi, I'm glad to be here, and I'm so moved by the images that you put, put forward and the, um, just how front and center climate change is, is in our lives. Uh, the words I wanted to say about the Nature Conservancy are simply um, weaving it into um, how the, the, the importance of climate has grown for our own conservation organization. So we've been around for 60 years. And um, I've been with the Conservancy three years, but um, for those who were there in the beginning, the mission was um, uh, protecting the last great places. And the idea was that a, a few scientists went out and said, if we don't protect this special place, it will be gone forever. And so we want to buy it and protect it and put a ring fence around it. And so as you think about some of the images that you saw today and that philosophy of putting a ring fence around a special place, there might be a flaw in that philosophy. And so through the years, as a, a science-based organization, we, we've had to evolve um, with what we call adaptive management. Our mission is protect, or to protect the land and water on which all life depends, and that all life includes um, people, too. And so uh, we believe that that can be done by working in securing fresh water, indeed protecting land as we always have, um, working on healthy oceans, uh, working in cities, so not the hinterlands, um, we have to be where the people are, and then also uh, through all of this uh, means climate change. And so our vision for climate change is to leverage the powerful synergy between ecosystems and advancing prosperous, thriving communities and um, at the same time addressing climate change. And so from a, from a strategy perspective, um, we're working with partners um, uh, um, around the globe, but um, really it's about mobilizing for a lower carbon future. So it's making people and players um, value carbon. It's using natural solutions in order to um, um, use the, the power of the machine that nature is for mitigating climate change, and then it's also um, finding ways of resiliency. And so um, as that relates to what we all can do individually, um, I go back to just what, what we believe um, are, are those levers. One is to protect those, those um, places that are providing the resiliency and the carbon stores. And so that means forests and grasslands matter, absolutely full stop, so the wetlands. And um, so the mangroves and um, the science is absolutely there that they provide that value. It, it means transforming how businesses and governments think about and use nature and so uh, I'll give an example, and that is uh, we have a partnership with Dow Chemical, and that might seem sort of far flung for a nature organization, right? So are we partnering with the chemical people? That sounds kind of bad. Um, but we believe um, if we aren't closely looking at solutions to um, how we operate really and bring the players together, that we're not going to change the, um, the way people act and value nature as it should be. Um, and then it's transforming just generally how people think and, and value nature. And so that means um, helping um, create a narrative around climate change that isn't so polemic. And so I'll give the example of um, an effort that's going on um, supported by the MacArthur Foundation, um, a partnership with the Nature Conservancy and Environmental Defense Fund, and that is funding um, several focal states, as we call them, um, 13 of them, Illinois is one of them, where we see it could go one way or another with policy, and I won't get too wonky into the details, but to say that um, with Illinois in particular, um, we have um, uh, one Senator Durbin we know is probably gonna vote the way we hope. We have Senator Kirk who sometimes does and sometimes doesn't, and then we have a new governor who has shown um, a lot of support in his personal life and um, um, 
some of his his actions for environment and love of the outdoors, but um, um, might have pressures that would make him vote in a way that we hope not. So a lot of work around making that happen. So, so talking about putting a fence around around uh, areas, I mean, obviously, as you kind of um, suggested, um, because of climate change, there's going to be clearly changes in the distribution of species that are going to be migrating in various areas uh, away from those protected places. Um, and what came to me right away when you said that was the issue of national parks. And even though it doesn't have much to do with water, what kinds of things might be done to kind of try to preserve the biota and the natural uh, systems in this case where the actual habitat is moving away from where we're protected? That's Jeff, all the way. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a few things that are happening there. For one, a lot of these places, they have a lot of inherent diversity in terms of their geology. So they're always going to host some neat suites of species. The actors are going to change, but the stage is always there. So those protected areas have, have tremendous value. Uh, people are also looking at other things, you know, like, um, and some of these are quite controversial, looking at assisted migration, actually moving species from where they are at one place to where they might be more suited to future conditions. Um, and, and, you know, as the Nature Conservancy, we take that type of thing very seriously. The, the changes that are wrought by climate change affect the places that we've been investing in protecting the last great places for the last 60 years. But we also recognize the value of natural areas into in addressing the solution. So about almost a quarter of the total greenhouse gas emissions come from doing things like deforestation and tilling up grasslands that release those, those things into the, into the atmosphere. But the flip side of that is that if we're successful with restoring degraded areas, those, car those forests that are replanted, those grasslands that are restored, they run that meter in reverse and they are taking those greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So while we're very keenly interested in climate change and how we adapt currently protected areas, we recognize that the working lands around the world can play a tremendous role in mitigating those effects of climate change by, by removing additional greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. What, uh, <laughs> but, but one of the mitigating factors, and as you, you probably know, is that all ecosystems are not the same. So here in the temperate region, a lot of the biomass is stored like a bank account in the soil. In the photo behind us, they don't have that luxury. The, uh, I describe, say, a temperate forest as a, uh, a candle and the rainforest is like a blowtorch. All of the biomass is up in the living forest. And once you cut down the forest, there's very little topsoil and it washes away very quickly. So we also should be considering um, local conditions and the viability of restoring an environment because not all environments are the same. And some, some of them we are beyond our capacity at this point to uh, truly restore. I'm not sure if I want to bring politics into this. Uh, should I? Sure. Yeah. Um, obviously, particularly in the United States, there's a lot of pushback to um, any sort of efforts to try to mitigate climate change, or in some cases, even admit that it's occurring. Um, what kind of um, are, are you guys? Are you optimistic that, um, say, for example, whatever happens uh, in Paris? Uh, over the last uh, week or so, that's ending pretty soon. Are there any going to be anything? Um, is there going to be anything accomplished that's actually going to uh, perhaps change the way the United States, anyway, uh, kind of sees, or at least politicians in the United States, many of them, see um, this threat or the lack, lack of it in their lives? Yeah, I'll, I'll give um, a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I am optimistic. And um, uh, one example I'll give is um, something we're working very intently on, and that is recasting um, the narrative, if you will, finding a middle ground. Um, we spend a lot of time talking with politicians and their staffers and, and lobbying, and in the quiet conversations, they're asking for cover in order to do the right thing. They get it. And so what we can do in order to um, 
recast that, that narrative, um, I think is, is quite important, and I think that people sort of see the writing on the wall. Um, I'll, 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 I'll speak on behalf of um, myself and some of what I've, I've read coming back from our folks in Paris, in, in that there is a lot of optimism that you know, new higher goals are, are being set, that um, it won't be enough, but that's sort of, everybody knows that it won't be enough, but there's a real um, locking of arms uh, uh, around the idea that those continued advancements need to happen. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop at that. And I, I share your optimism. I'll, I'll just add that I think, you know, in, in the near term, a lot of the, the movement in terms of building this, this swell of support for addressing climate change really starts at the ground level where people are experiencing climate change now. So that I think there's a lot of uh, headway to be made in building a broad base of support for a larger policy and issues by working with municipalities that are dealing with water supply issues, flood uh, damages, dealing with agriculture interests, you know, that are, are seeing their, their patterns and supplies disrupted. So I think starting at that level will help to kind of build the, the more pragmatic center that is going to move the needle on larger policy initiatives. Maybe this would be a great time to see if there are some questions for the audience. Um, absolutely. Um, we'll open it up for questions for anyone else in the back. You know, the visuals are amazing, you know, but it seems that a lot of decisions are made by here. What is the benefit, the cost benefit associated? And given that so many of these things are kind of fluffy in a way, you know, yes, they're really lies, but it's easier to sell palm oil, it's easier to make money off an arable land. And have you seen or experienced good examples where uh, you're able to monetize the benefits of carbon capture or stormwater management better practices in terms of the long scale? You know, looking 50, 60 years out, but how do you like monetize that benefit? If there's any examples of that, that you're hopeful. I think that's for you. All right, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give this one. I'll give this one a go. Um, so there, there are a few cases, and there's there's actually a, you know a still functioning private market where companies that have set for themselves carbon caps and they do offsets. So the mechanics of how you would do that in terms of documenting. Um, conservation-based or other mitigation things in terms of energy efficiency that help to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions overall. Sort of the methodology has been worked out in some of these private markets. If only we could actually establish uh, a, an open market so, and, and one that was one, one that required participation or had broader participation in it, we could see those things moving. On the water side, there, there are better examples, uh, in, and especially in terms of securing freshwater systems. The Nature Conservancy works in a lot of places, particularly in Latin America, with a strategy of water funds, where essentially municipal ratepayers are investing in conservation actions that secure their su water supply in the watersheds that feed those municipal sources. So by fencing cattle out of streams, by preventing development in those aquifer recharge zones that the ratepayers are contributing to, they're essentially guaranteeing their water security far into the future. I want to add to that, and, and I can take off my computational social science hat and put on my, my fonder but a little older anthropology hat. Um, I'm, I'm sort of interested in water specifically because water um, resists being commoditized in a lot of ways. So even water prices, um, for example, in Tucson where we live, um, how do you decide what the price of water is going to be to a, to a resident, you know? Um, and it turns out that, that you could do it by figuring out how much it costs to deliver the water, or you could do it by figuring out how much the, the cost of using that water writ broadly is. Um, and instead, they sort of split the difference, and if you're only using a minimal amount, then you pay a fairly low rate, you're actually being subsidized, and if you go for the giant fountain in your yard, then you're, you're paying a bit more. But it turns out that looking more broadly at, at other places around the world, water is used for so many different things and has so much, so many different meanings that it resists sort of being put into, into an easy commodification. And so one of the questions that I perhaps don't have an answer to, but I like to think about, is which is the right direction? Is the right direction to figure out how to commoditize it and to integrate it into this system? 
or is the right direction to recognize that it's better off if we don't put it into that box, but we instead allow for lots and lots of different uses um, that indigenous peoples may put to it or, or the meanings that they may have for it um, and figure out a way to, to work that out without trying to put it into a commodity system. I don't have an answer to that, but I'd just like to think about it. I might take a, a, a more holistic approach. Uh, I mentioned, first of all, the rainforest and, and uh, Inner Mongolia and China. With China, um, they're spending billions of dollars trying to rehabilitate this. They, they understand what's going on and they've got a huge problem with the uh, advancing deserts. We're getting the sand in, in Japan. So I think they understand that managing water properly saves them billions of dollars and stops migration of people out of a huge region. So I think they're, you know, Frank, I, I'm not sure they're gonna be able to achieve their goals, but they're moving in the right direction. Likewise, in Malaysia, uh, the problem may someday be lack of water, but now it's, it's too much water. And this particular area here, they had a massive flood last uh, winter where they dumped, the river came up 50 feet, 50 feet. So they've, they've got a huge problem. And I, I see the, the oil palm situation logging. It's just greed and mismanagement. We, a lot of the places where, the, where climate change is most acute and water problems is huge corruption. Had they managed their resources properly, for example, had logged in certain areas and kept oil palm in certain areas, uh, they wouldn't be facing these problems which are disrupting their society and it's going to cost them a lot of money to uh, get the situation under control. So in, in both cases, corruption, mismanagement of resources uh, is coming back to bite these countries quite, quite uh, fiercely. Thanks. I think we could probably spend uh, years on this topic uh, ourselves, so let's move on. I'll go here and come back. Yes. Uh, I, I wonder, when I hear the Dow Chemical is now in the forefront of the battle against climate change, I think of uh, uh, Rachel Carlson when she published her book, Silent Spring. She was smashed by the chemical industry, including the Dow Chemical. I, I don't want to associate with people like that. I'd rather have them find the edge of the world and take a step forward. Uh, as, for, as far as China is concerned, uh, it's all very well to talk about that water problem, but right now they're having a little problem with air, breathing the air in China. So it, it's a matter of how you slice this up. I have two questions. Number one, for uh, people up front, uh, I, I read extensively James Lock, Love Lock, and he's he's not optimistic. He he is he was not optimistic. Uh, for him, we have gone beyond the tip, tipping point. So I'd like to ask the people in front of me. Uh, have we gone beyond the tipping point? I think so. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, um, I uh, you know, my, my, I am starting to get more interested in the global climate simulation community. Um, there's a project that I'm working on right now that is actually, um, trying to figure out how to better integrate the kind of social science modeling that I do, which ultimately can simulate individuals and to package this into the global climate models that Department of Energy and other universities are developing. Um, and the larger context of that, of course, is are we already past the point, we're already past the point where remediation is going to be very expensive, um, if we can ever you know, even think about that. But uh, are we, past the point where remediation is completely impossible. I don't know the answer to that. I worry that the answer may be yes, but I don't know. But it's possible. Not, not so much remediation. I mean, remediation is really difficult. Yeah. Um, and we may, in fact, in fact, be past the tipping point. Uh, I mean, things are happening a lot, if I understand correctly, a lot more rapidly than uh, folks, scientists thought uh, just a few years ago. Um, but to not take 
very serious and strong efforts to uh, reduce carbon emissions and, and uh, try to protect water, it's just going to get worse. Whether we've passed a, a tipping point or not, uh, we have to start working on, uh, on mitigation on what we're going to do to make, um, you know, to kind of make the best of it and, and have not only humans uh, living as comfortably as possible, but um, also the, the natural environment. So whether we've reached a tipping point or not, at least I don't think that should influence efforts to try to curb um, CO2, CO2 emissions. All right, I have a second question. I'll be very brief. Uh, and the second question deals with the Amazon rainforest, uh, which is referred to as the lungs of the planet, and not just the forest, uh, rainforest in, a in Amazon, but uh, Borneo, maybe go through a long list, into China. The land is being decimated by companies to plant their, their fields and you know, palm oil. Uh, in, the, in the instance of the Amazon rainforest, uh, would, would you favor, because we're in the killing business, so that's what the administration is figuring out, how many people to kill, and other people are figuring out how many people to kill. So killing is really fashionable. Would, would you favor sending uh, a large army into Brazil and start killing anyone who decimates the rainforest? I would. Uh, I don't think that's acceptable. <laughs> there's all kinds of issues. Acceptable. I also think there's all kinds of international uh, treaty issues. Is, uh, yeah. All right, let's, let's move to another question back here and then over here. Yeah, so um, I'm kind of curious in the migration questions that we're talking about, um, if in other parts of the world that are going to see it first, look at the toil, um, like big cities and how migration is going to make those cities even bigger and the pressures of sea level rise and frequent storms. Um, what is the, the concept of the it's controversial, it's political, of the haves helping the have-nots and the fact that, you know, we've had the benefit of being able to do all the uh, emissions and the benefit from that, but yet they're the ones that are really in the regions where, you know, they're getting the biggest impact. I'm seeing the 19th century again in China with 21st century technology likewise in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a we issue. And Finger pointing isn't going to help anybody anywhere. However, technological exchange, there's going to have to be a involved. But at the end of the day, uh, we could go carbon neutral in the United States and this problem doesn't go away unless India and China are a part of that. But I also look at it as China has a tremendous opportunity, and we all do. Uh, they can make their their economy and industry far more efficient in the process. This is something that people are conveniently overlooking. So there, there's a tremendous opportunity. China could actually leapfrog past us if they could solve this problem with their own technology. So, um, but I, I look at it as it as a we proposition, um, and finger pointing doesn't help anybody. Yeah. I agree. I mean, that's a, that's a very tricky issue. I mean, most of the, the greenhouse gases that are in the additional greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere, it's because of what Europe and North America have been doing for 200 years. We didn't know that it was going to have this consequence for most of that period. Uh, but still, that, the, the point, point stands that the most vulnerable people with the least means to cope with climate change are going to be the ones that, that feel the biggest impacts. And, and it seems only fair uh, that the more fortunate nations assist the weakest and most vulnerable persons. You know, I think we only have time for one more question, but we're certainly going to be around uh, for a while after that, so we can have discussions uh, individually. I, I've got her in. Sorry. Thank you, um, and thank you for your discussion. Um, I'm really curious about the um, consumer's responsibility, especially in healthy nations. Now, we sort of talked about nations somehow. 
But when, um, if I'm reading correctly, beef has such a large impact, it's, they're tearing down rainforests for beef, uh, beef instead of beef, beef. But we don't pay very much for beef. Right? Um, the phys we, we worry about our cars, but as an architect, I know buildings produce more greenhouse gases than cars do. Um, and we're continuing not to pay any attention as consumers um, to that. So when we talk about governments, we're still not seeing the effect of climate, of the impact, other than the folks whose houses burn down. I'm not being impacted very much, even though I'm doing all sorts of things that are not beneficial at all. Some knowingly and many not knowingly. And it seems to me that in order to have any significant impact, we have to work on the consumers of the false wealth emissions. Does that make any sense? Yes. <laughs> so what does it take to do that? That's my question. Um, yes, there are people creatively working on it. Um, I know from the Conservancy's perspective, we know we'll fail in our mission if we don't engage people to value nature, full stop. And that's part of the reason why we're working so um, assiduously in, in cities, um, urban nature matters. It's not just for beauty and enjoyment. Of course, we get that, and we also get biodiversity. Um, we also get reduction in heat islands. We get cleaner air. And um, I'm not answering your question. I really know that. But I'm going to say that while a massive consumer shift, um, I hear exactly what you're saying. Yeah, we don't feel it in our everyday lives. But I know we are working really hard to help people understand the gift that um, nature gives. And part of that gift is reduction of carbon in a carbon store. The students that are in the Institute of Environmental Sustainability, um, these guys are, they're enthusiastic, they're fantastic, they're tenacious. Um, they'll do anything that needs to be done. And, um, and they're really smart and creative. And I really think the generation that's coming up now, having been kind of raised under these conditions, is becoming much more aware of what kinds of impacts uh, we all have doing various things that we do. So in, in that sense, I mean, I do think that the only way this stuff is really going to be, we need a, a massive change in um, societal culture. Uh, we can't continue to do the same kind of stuff we've been doing, but that has to start from the ground up. We can't, it can't be imposed on us. Um, I agree that in some cases, you know, uh, prices don't reflect, or in many cases, prices don't reflect what the impact is, and that probably should also be looked at. But I really am, I hate to say I'm optimistic, uh, so I'm a pessimist at heart, I'm a half, glass half empty guy. But anyway, um, you know, I gotta be optimistic based on working with these young people all the time. I mean, we got bottled water banned on campus because of a student group, but now Dasani is selling flavored water beverage. <laughs> I'd like to, to make a comment. But I also think um, the, the technologies exist. Um, I'm, I'm quite benefit. I have the benefit of living in Japan, where um, the average carbon footprint is about 60 percent the average carbon footprint here. Postwater society. Now it's a different country than than the U.S. It's much more densely populated, but they never stop using bicycles. Um, I always use the example of the heated toilet seats. How that seems so uh, lavish, uh, but th the truth is that the they we heat one room or pool one room at a time. And the bathroom is not the room that we do it. So it's actually quite green just to heat the toilet seat. Uh, when you use, uh, when it fills the tank of the toilet, this would be great in Arizona, California, there's a spigot on the top and feeds into the lid. You can wash your hands without using extra water and it goes right into the toilet. Little things like that. Uh, delivery man in my neighborhood, brilliant. He takes a truck full of packages, pulls a bicycle out of the back, has a little trailer attached to the bicycle, fills the little trailer full of packages, parks that bicycle on the corner, and walks the trolley 
with the packages around. And this is a matter of course. And public transportation, we could have it in this, the urban areas and the immediate suburbs. Maybe not, you know, of course not rural areas. So there are things that people are doing now in post-industrial society that could significantly get us in the right direction. It wouldn't solve the problems, but it would point us in a good direction. So Japanese have taught me a lot of uh, good things that way. I can just add, add one more thing. Part of the, the, the kind of simulation modeling that I do can study things like how information flows through a population and how things like norms and values can change in a population and how um, the, the actions and values of a particular individual can be affected by what's going on around them. And this can, you know, I suppose everything can be put to, to evil purposes, but it can be put to, to good purposes as well, trust me. Um, you can sort of ask, how do we effect a change? So you get you know, your utility bills. Does it matter if it tells you your use is above average? It turns out, eh, maybe a little bit. It matters more if it tells you your use is above your average in your immediate neighborhood. Um, another example from the, the Phoenix and Tucson area, just sort of, you know, the, the respect that I have for how difficult this is, but also the encouraging aspect, the, the notions of beauty, what's beautiful? I mean, that's sort of deep and, and personal. And it used to be that you looked at a lush green lawn in Phoenix and you thought, that's beautiful. Time passes, more and more of the lawns are now xeric, they're conserving water, they look like the desert landscape, and now when people look at a green lawn in Phoenix, they think, oh my god, that's not beautiful, that's, that's wasteful. And effecting that kind of change is difficult. It takes time, but it, it can be done, and there are people who are, are, are working toward it. Thank you. I think, um, well, we could clearly talk with these experts all night and keep learning and so forth. This is a great moment to thank the folks from the Nature Conservancy, from Argonne, Everyday Climate Change, and from Loyola University for sharing all of their knowledge with us. And then simply continue the conversation. We're not going anywhere. We'll, we'll tidy up and we'll be here. And we invite you to follow all of their organizations here in Chicago, nationally and internationally, to come back for the next two months while we have the work up on the wall. Engage with us. If you have, we're open during the week and on Saturdays. If you have anybody you'd like to bring in, feel free to contact us. We're happy to do special tours. We're happy to do outreach. We've just taken James to three schools in Chicago. We're feeling very enthused about second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, and ninth graders and the amazing questions they asked over the last two days. So I'm feeling hopeful too. And I thank you very much. And post Water Chicago for two months, okay? Thank you.